Romans 8, verse 28, these so very famous words, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And our title is When God Directs the Course of Our Life. That's what I'd like us to think about in the short time available to us. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing to believers in Rome. And this passage, the chapter, and these particular words are about the providential oversight of his people, God's providential oversight. And the Apostle Paul is able to start these, this particular verse in very confident terms. We know, and we know. The Greek actually says we now know, or we know now. Our King James Version, we know that. Simple and emphatic. But uh, we, we have always known since conversion. And it is the record we look at. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. These are amazing words. All things work together for good. We need to explore them. They're very rich. They can be so easily misunderstood. There is one of the modern versions, the New International Version, wrecks this passage. It says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And that's wrecked the sense of the Apostle Paul. You may think it says much the same thing, but it loses something vital. It steamrollers away the figure of speech, the figure that is here in this passage, the personification of forces and influences. Look at it again. We know that all things work together as though all things can be seen as human, which they're not, of course. All events, all occurrences, all happenings, all accidents, all actions that affect us, that all the things that happen to us and bear upon us, as though you can clothe them with human personality, that's the figure of speech that the Apostle uses. We know, we've proved throughout our Christian lives that all events, actions, activities work together, act together, cooperate together. The Greek term is literally that. Actually, it's the other way around. All things, it's a compound word, together work. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the same word, or very closely the same word, is translated as co-laborers, or fellow laborers, fellow workers. And that's the idea here. All things that ever happen to us, it is as though they are fellow laborers working in our lives. Adverse things, painful things, difficult things. If we're believers, if we're Christians, God knows what he wants to allow to happen to us, what he's going to permit. He may not be directly the author of these things, if they're harmful things or evil things, but he knows what he's going to permit, the circumstances he's going to allow to arise, even if others around us, other forces give rise to them immediately and he knows what influences he's going to send into our lives himself because he's training us like a coach training and training an athlete prescribing many things which are painful to the athlete or difficult to bear to enhance ultimately that athlete's skill or performance in the same way we know We've proved, the Apostle seems to say, that all 
circumstances, events, happenings are seemingly working together for the long-term good of the believer. That's an astonishing concept, to be in the hand of God, to be not living a life which is just in a completely haphazard environment where you're subject entirely to chance, where things just happen to you. But this is for believers, which implies that non-believers, people who have never found the Lord, people who resist him or don't want him or turn away from him, will never have this ordered life, this life which is planned, this life which is organized, orchestrated by the living God, where all events add up to something which God desires. Well, what are the good things? We need to look at the details. We know and we've proved, and Christians do prove this. I hope you don't mind a personal comment, but I was converted to Christ some 66 years ago. And uh, amidst all my failures and efforts and so on in life and wanderings and ups and downs, there's one thing when you look back is absolutely clear that the Christian is in the hands of God and everything that has been allowed to happen has been ultimately for my good. And everything good that has happened has been measured carefully so that it didn't boost me up or ruin me, but came in just that right measure. Everything orchestrated. We know this said the Apostle. Think of the Apostle Paul. Well, he was a missionary to the Gentiles, travelled miles and miles with many hardships and dangers and much opposition in the world of those days. Many attacks upon him, many occasions when he went without food and provision. Even among his own people, the Jews, there would be great persecution and hostility. But he says, we've been through all these things and the Lord delivered us out of them all, ultimately. And through all the course of his life, he was helped and enabled and he saw deliverances. He had to take the hardships because he'd handed them out. He'd been a persecutor of Christians. Now he was a chosen missionary. He must take hardships himself. But his evidence is that God was with him all the way through. And look at what he accomplished under the hand of God. Look at these mighty epistles, like the epistle to the Romans, given by the inspiration of the living God, a wisdom far above human wisdom, that have survived, intact, kept to this very day, and will do so to the end of time. What a huge amount of the word of God in the New Testament came through the Apostle Paul and the founding of so many churches and the bringing about of the ultimately worldwide mission to Gentiles and Jews, which was the New Testament church. We know, he says, and all his fellow workers say the same, and so do all Christians. We know that all things, what things? What is included in the all things? What is he thinking about? Does he mean literally everything? Work together for good? Yes, every influence. But then what does he mean by good? That's another question. Does he mean unbroken health? Does he mean wealth? You might think that's good. Does he mean fame? Does he mean great influence? Does he mean authority? Does he mean possessions and houses and cars? What does he mean by good? All things conspire together, or better word, cooperate together under God's direction for our good. But what is good? Some of the things I've mentioned are good up to a point, but they're not that good. 
For to begin with, they're only good on earth. They're only good for now. They won't be good ultimately. I know a person when she was younger, a few years, some years ago, she worked as a PA to the uh, boss of the biggest firm of accountants in this country. A big and an esteemed partnership. This man had made it. She was in and out of his office constantly, obviously. She had to uh, bring plans to him and proposals and coordinate things and do his uh, running so on to different executives in the office. She had to organize for him his timetable, but she was his PA and very busy. But he'd made it, this man. He was a very, very strong personality, she told me, and very powerful. And he ruled that partnership effectively, that big firm, and uh, the richest of them all in its day, with a rod of iron. And yet he had great humor, and the politicians consulted with him. He had influence. He was famed and known throughout the city. He was a big noise, as big as they come. He wasn't very old. He was 51 when something happened, which changed all that. And there he was in his office, top of his world, top of his profession, as successful as he could have been, enjoying every moment of it. And uh, this person I know, this relatively young woman at the time, witnessed his big heart attack in the office. It didn't at that stage end his life. It did within a few years, his troubles. But it certainly ended his reign. And it ended his time of apparent health and ease and triumph. And what had caused it? Well, although he carried them well, of course, it was all the pressures that he wanted. It was handling all that authority and wealth and power and influence. He worked such long days, he seemed to be able to get away with it. He seemed to ride over it. But all the time, it was at work within him. But it all came crashing down for him, at any rate. Well, only make this rather obvious point, because this happens. I remember once picking up a publication which used to publish in a little column all the famous obituaries for the week. And this particular week, they were all in their late 40s and early 50s. And yet they were all people renowned in some sporting or artistic or political activity. That particular week, a whole clutch of people went relatively young. Life is unpredictable. What is good in life? Why the wealth that we may crave and the influence that we may crave and the authority and the possessions, look at what they can do to you. Oh, they may give you happiness up to a point and they may make you feel very good. And as the saying goes, feel very good about yourself. Are they also possibly making you conceited? and selfish, and even more greedy, and perhaps jealous of your peers, and perhaps treacherously unkind to anybody who is a challenge to you, and cruel even. Well, it doesn't have to have that effect, but so very often it does. What do you think the Bible means by good? Simply wealth and good. Feeling good? No, it tells us what is meant by good in the passage. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And then in the very next verse we read this. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, listen to this, to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's one of the good things, to be made holy to be made a better person, to be changed within, 
so that the meanness and the pride and the cruelty and the violence are all pressed down and new virtues come in and we're different people and better people to be conformed to the image of his son, to be made progressively something more like Christ until the very end of life when God transforms us completely into purity and holiness. And then, at the end of verse 30, whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's something that takes place when we go to heaven and even at the resurrection of the body when we're completely glorified. But we're given life, spiritual life, even now, and that's glorious. These are the good things, so let's define good. We know that all things work together for our spiritual and moral and eternal good. That's the good which the Apostle Paul has in mind. That's what he mentions in the context here. For our spiritual and moral and eternal good, God orchestrates all the events of life. We could go further and so that we produce something for him in our service for him and in our witness to him and in our love for him, our worship of him. God causes all things to labor together, work together for our eternal good. Note that language and that great figure of speech, together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. What if you're not a believer? What if we don't want God? And we say, I want moral liberty. I want to do as I want, anything I want. I want just the here and now. I want possessions and sensations. I want to indulge my lusts. I want entertainment, crazy things in extremes. Here, kicks, the bright lights and so on. I don't want God. I don't want holiness. I don't want to walk with him. I don't want to know him. Well, then your life will be entirely haphazard and lived at random. Let me give you a poor illustration. What if you lived in a forest, a jungle? Well, some beautiful things in the jungle. There's some wonderful plants and trees. You could build a tree house, make it how you want it, fashion it, enjoy designing it, build it up aloft in a secure place. But it would be foolish and romantic to think that that would really amount to an ordered life. Yes, you'd have some delightful fruits to eat. And you could have some pleasures and enjoyment. But think of it. There are the wild beasts. What may happen tomorrow, the next day, ten minutes' time? What diseases? What trials, what problems, whatever might happen, you're in an unruly, chaotic jungle. What is your life? The last thing it's ever going to be is ordered. You might be able to order a little corner of it, but not very much. And I'm sorry, friends, but that's the life of an unbeliever. You never know. What's going to happen? Are you going to be redundant? Is there going to be a war? Is there going to be another pandemic? Is there going to be economic collapse? Are you going to have great trouble in the family? Are you going to have a, a serious health problem? All these things will happen at random. 
They'll come out of the blue. You're picking your way through a minefield. You're on your own. You've no divine help. All things do not work together for good for you. Now, I don't want to frighten anybody. I don't think that's possible into the kingdom of God. Nor do I want to bait anybody. Oh, look, if you come to Christ and you trust in him, you'll have a better life. No, the only way to come to Christ is by realizing I'm a sinner and I've sinned against God and I've seized my life for myself and I haven't worshipped him and studied him and obeyed his laws and I'm away from him and I resist him and I hate him and I fall on my knees when I hear about a saviour and I repent of my sin and my waywardness and I ask him to save me, to change me, to put new life into me. And he does, amazingly. He forgives me on account he can do that because Christ has come and suffered in the place of all those who approach him with sincere hearts. And he forgives and he relates you to yourself, to himself, brings your soul to life and you know him and pray to him and walk with him and he intervenes in your life, answers your prayers, guides you and helps you. Sometimes he lets you go. When we're headstrong as Christian believers and we go the wrong way, sometimes God allows us to go so that we reap the consequences and come back to him. And then he restores our joy and communion and peace. And we've learned a lesson and we advance, but he orchestrates all influences to fashion us and shape us and advance us so that we love him more and praise him more and obey him more. But the life of the unbeliever is random and haphazard and disordered entirely. Dear friends, why be an unbeliever? Why cling on to cynicism about God and the life of sin and selfishness and disobedience to him? Why cling on in rebellion when the outcome is a chaotic future and life. You may have times of success, but only times. There'll be so many things that you'll never understand, that you'll never figure out. But when we come to Christ, we come not for a better life, but for forgiveness of sin, for acceptance by God, to be able to be admitted to his care and to eternal glory when we die. But we get more than we ever expected. God orchestrating every inch of the journey and ultimately taking us safely home. You can see this, look, in the history of the church. I'm talking about individuals and what they experience in life. But think of the, well, this, back to the New Testament. There was Christ. He goes to Calvary's cross. He allows himself to be arrested in apparent weakness and crucified and slain. But he's doing it so that God can put upon him the guilt of the sin of all who would be saved. And he took the eternal weight of punishment in a few hours instead of us. Well, that's why he did it. But everything seems to have come to an end. Christ is crucified. Whatever's going to happen? Will there now be a church? Well, you see the outcome. God's hand at work. There is the day of Pentecost when the Spirit comes down upon the early church and immediately things begin to happen. 3,000 Jewish people who up to that point were so stubborn 
and would not come to Christ and would not uh, obey him, fall at his feet and repent of their sin and their lives are changed and a few days later another 5,000 and then many more and then the Gentiles. Who ever thought that Gentiles would be saved? Those pagans, just one or two here and there would come as proselytes and worship with the Jews that most hated the faith of God's people. But now in their thousands, they begin to turn in one land after another. And you see the hand of God at work in the early churches. You see his preservation of the apostles until they gave their final witness in martyrdom. You see Christ at work in the world in the same way as he works in the lives of individuals. It came to my mind, you may not have heard, most Christians have, but you may not have heard of a very, very famous missionary in the 18th century. Well, he started at the end of the 17th century. His name was William Carey, and uh, he went out to India. The father, we call him, of modern missions. And he sought to learn languages and labor, working with his own hands in India and witnessing for some seven years. Then he was joined by other missionaries and the mission really took off, so to speak. But something very curious happened. Isn't it just one illustration? And I'm going so long ago for it, of how all things work together for good in the lives of Christian people. By a strange sequence of events, he ended up in a place that he never actually planned to go to with two helpers, compatriots, Joshua Marshman and William Ward. William Ward came from this church, or its forerunner church. And they went to a place in India called Sarampore. It wasn't a very big place. It was part of a very small little territory. And there they planted their true mission, their print house, their workshop, their first place of education, translating the scriptures into various Indian dialects and languages. In the end, they translated into 46 languages and those of other nations too. But they built up their print shop. They had all the fonts for the types, all little metal slugs for all the different language typefaces. They built it up, and something went wrong. What went wrong was that the British uh, trading company that ran India for the British uh, colonial power turned against the missionaries and they had to be rounded up and arrested and the places that they'd established whether they were schools, colleges, print houses, publishing houses ransacked and overturned and that was started and they began to wreck the work of the Christian missionaries but as an example of how God works Strangely, strangely, there was one little place in India the British authorities couldn't touch, and that was Serampore. And why was that? It, because that little territory, that little patch, had been given by the King of England to the King of Denmark as a birthday present some years previously. And it wasn't British. And when they went to Serampore, that was not a factor that they really knew about or took any interest in. But when the great persecution started, the print shop, the publishing house, the headquarters, the work of missions under Carey was preserved because it couldn't be got at by the colonial authority. Amazing things happen in the lives of... I could go on all, all night with accounts of wonderful things that have happened in the annals of Christian missionary work. 
and they happen in our lives. I've seen it personally again and again. Things that were painful 20 years before, and now you see the point of them and the purpose of them and how all things work together to help you through things you never foresaw or never expected. And every Christian can say this, that all things and circumstances and events work together to promote our godliness, our communion with Christ, our moral advance, our Christian service, service for the Lord. It is an astonishing, amazing thing. Time is almost up, well it is up. But I could tell you about others too. The two preachers in the beginning of the uh, 18th century, or early in the 18th century, John Wesley, founder of the Methodists, and George Whitfield, well, they were both converted in 1738. Both former university students, that was something in those days, and scholars who became clergymen. And they were both converted, quite separately, George Whitfield first, and a few years after that, John Wesley. And they were, both became clergymen and both began to preach. What did they preach? Oh, they preached conversion, the necessity of the new birth, of repenting of your sin. They both preached that Christ died for sinners. And if we come to him in repentance and faith, he will save us and convert us and change us and bring us to himself. And we will walk with him and know him and prove him and love him and serve him. But the churches were dead at the time and the clergy didn't want it. And so between 1738 and 1739, both these preachers in different places were barred from entering churches, though they were clergymen, by the clergy, and they were not allowed to preach. It happened famously to John Wesley, uh, to the town of his birthplace in Epworth, St. Andrew's Church there. The clergyman barred him from entry and preaching. It happened to George Whitfield down in the Bristol area. What did they do? They went out in the open air and preached. And the results were phenomenal. Because of time, I'll tell you just about George Whitfield. He first preached in the open air. He thought it would be to a few dozen people, maybe, and thousands gathered. This was in the Bristol area, in the fields. And he wrote in his diary that the trees and the hedges were just full of people, thousands of them. And famously it said, he wondered if they understood him. He wondered if they grasped his message, how that Christ died for their sins. But he knew when they were listening, because these men had all come out of nearby pits, and their faces were black with the coal dust. And suddenly, you could see the white streaks down their faces, as the men, under his preaching, broke down in tears, those tough miners, and there were hundreds of them awakened spiritually and turned their hearts over to Christ and repented of sin. What was the influence that led to that? Whitfield went on to preach around the country. They say he preached over 18,000 times in the open air in the course of his life, not only here, but he made umpteen trips to America. His name is still famous in America because of the Great Awakening. If you study history, you must have heard of the Great Awakening. It began in 1739 in this country, such an influence in the country, with thousands of people turning to the Lord, hundreds of thousands. Whitfield first preached in London in this area, 
He came to the Kennington Common just a few hundred yards away. He preached at Gallows Corner. You know Gallows Corner? It's the other side of the Kennington Park, only now on that site is built St. Mark's Church, Kennington. That was Gallows Corner. It was called Gallows Corner because they used to hang the sheep stealers there. And that's where Whitfield preached to 40 to 50,000 people at six o'clock in the morning. Amazing. What started all that? Being banned from the pulpit in the church. All things work together for good to them that love God. Our time is out. Are you going to flounder about trends in life? No time for God against him, a haphazard random life. Or will all things work together for your spiritual and eternal good because you've found the Saviour and you've come to Christ. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, look upon us all and help us, we ask. Bless this night and draw lost souls to the Saviour. Grant that it may be true in our case that all things work together for our spiritual good. We ask these things in our dear Saviour's name. Amen.